wife here is ready to go to battle. battle. Today you will observe a similar discipline for the spirit. We have uh, one case in the doctrine today, and that's the name of the case is Fisher versus Universal Texas. Over today and over the next several days, you will hear several cases that are going to be argued by students and by government econ class. Here is how it works. Students from my, from my class have spent the last three months writing, researching current Supreme Court cases. These students have been assisted by Lawyer Academy of Champion debate team coaches, Mr. Hume and Mr. Uh, Batterman. They've been further assisted by senior varsity debate members, Alex Dunner, Rahil Patel, Joe Rosado, James Walker, and Tanya Srinivasan. The students will play the role of lawyers using the skills that they have learned and honed over the past three months. The students in my class will take their shot at trying to convince the student judges, the gallery audience who is assembled here at Western Chapel today, and our digital audience who are watching on Lure Academy Live via the internet at their side should win. Following oral arguments, we will cut away to the courtroom um, to our studio here at Lure Academy Court TV. Uh, <coughs> following to our commentary by our resident experts and a few of guests will be revealed later, we will engage in a little audience participation. Audience participation will occur in a variety of ways. Audience members here in the chapel will be able to vote using their personal devices, which attorney they believe did a better job, articulating his arguments, and which side they predict will actually win the case. So we will have both a, essentially a popular vote and a legal electoral college vote. And we all know how important both are, but in the end, it is the electoral college vote, in other words, what the judges say in this case, which rules the day. Now, you, our digital audience, will also be able to participate as well. Uh, you, you may chat with me online, real time, by using todaysmeet.com. The exact address is http um, backslash backslash t-o-d-a-y-s-m-e-t dot com slash bkj Brian uh, just sort of Just sort of bkj. Now, Students from Mr. Broad's video class and my government classes will play the role of judges and will render judgment following the oral arguments on the first case that um, you will hear before you. The cases are real and they are currently before the actual Supreme Court. So no one really knows precisely how the case will come out. All right, now, without further ado, let's kick off Supreme Court week and Black History Month here at Woodward Academy. I hope you enjoy the arguments and that you learn something along the way. All right, now, um, let's introduce the first case. The name of the first case is Fisher versus University of Texas. Um, Ms. Perdue, what are your thoughts going into this particular case?
it's interesting because this is a rare instance in which the government and the ACLU uh, are in agreement, uh, not just for civil rights reasons, but also for economic reasons. There have been more than 70 friend of the court briefs filed on behalf of the University of Texas. They've come from 37 high-ranking retired military officers, including three former chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, including Colin Powell, 57 leading corporations, 444 prominent social scientists, the Anti-Defamation League, and a large number of colleges and universities, over 100, including all of the Ivy League uh, schools. The Fortune 100 organization, in their brief, called Inclusive Admissions a Business and Economic Imperative. So this is a case where uh, the business community, the military, the government, uh, and civil rights advocates are all strongly in favor of the University of Texas. Uh, and we'll see what the Supreme Court ultimately decides. Yes, and it's, it seems to me that I hear the Supreme Court um, uh, out in the hallway, and I think they're about to about to start. So, um, so we will turn the camera over to the uh, Supreme Court um, as I see the justices are about to proceed. Thank you very much for watching Board Academy Court TV. The United States Supreme Court is now in session. The Honorable United States Supreme Court Justices preside. The first case on the docket is Fisher v. The University of Texas at Austin. You may all be seated. Is the attorney for Fisher ready to proceed? Is the attorney for University of Texas at Austin ready to proceed? Yes, sir. Attorney for Fisher, you may approach the podium. You have the court's attention. Um, I am Abe Adesokin, and I represent Fisher in the case Fisher versus the University of Texas, of Texas at Austin. You know, the University of Fisher v. The University of Texas is a case in which my client, Abigail Fisher, is questioning whether or not the University of Texas or UT's admissions policy falls under the 14th Amendment and is allowed to use race as part of admission. Um, the University of Texas uses, oh, sorry. Um, my client believes that she was denied admission because the university, because she was white, and the University of Texas uses a policy that has race as one of the factors in its admission policy. She claims this because that there are many African American and other minorities applicants who were accepted and who were less qualified than her. Um, the University of Texas at Austin has a, in their policy, the people who are in the highest 10% of their class receive automatic admission, and the rest of them, while their admission is based on two scores, the academic index and the personal achievement index. The academic index is a prediction of their freshman year GPA that's based on your class ranking and your standardized test scores while the personal achievement index is based off of essay scores and a score known as the personal achievement score, which is based off their extracurricular activities, community service, and special circumstances, including um, social economic status of the applicant's family, the language they speak at home, and among, um, and among other things, the applicant's cultural background and race. And do you think that these measurements are the best way to determine a candidate's um, 
ability to do well in school? Um, no, I do not. And why is that? Even though it was stated that, even though it was stated nine years ago that, in some that if it's used to create a more diverse student body, you can use race as an admission, as an admissions factor. But you can only use it if you're if it's in the effort to create a more stu diverse student body. But because of their policy of accepting top 10 percent, the University of Texas already has a diverse student body. Thank you. But the main issue is whether or not that the University of Texas is constitutionally allowed to use the use race as a factor and whether or not the Bruder versus Bollinger decision that stated it was allowed to that it was constitutional to use race if it's to make a more diverse student body should be overturned. If the case, if the Supreme Court case is overturned, it would allow every it would allow people who are not in the top ten percent or to have a fair chance and not receive any unfair advantages that could be caused by race being used as a factor. Since the since the University of Texas did not state how race can be used, how race is used, it can be assumed that it can either raise or lower your score in combination with other factors, which means that somebody like some maybe minorities might receive their, might receive a higher score compared to other ones in order to maybe sort of even out the odds. And that could be considered both regular discrimination, because it could be saying that they're not as smart as other people and require assistance to get into the schools, and also reverse discrimination because it, it gives those minorities an unfair advantage. Can you clarify what you mean by even out the odds? Like saying um, that they aren't, like, it could be discrimination in the fact that they're not, saying that they're not smart enough so they need their scores boosted if they're a certain ethnicity to give them a better chance of getting into the school. Not only would overturning the case, the good decision, make it more fair for all people, it also make others want, it also make others try harder in the event that it does raise your score because you would know that it would not be as easy to get into the school. Also, and the University of Texas claims that you may use race if it's one of many factors, but since the race is what, since race and background are much, are many of the factors just stated differently. It's not really being one of many, but one of few of the factors used in admission. Does this conclude your remarks? Yes. Do you have any questions, Justices? No questions? Bailiff, could we talk to the uh, groundskeepers outside, perhaps? Thank you. So, Attorney for Fisher, you may return to your seat. Thank you. And at this time, the Attorney for University of Texas at Austin, if you would, approach the podium. You have the court's attention. I'm Aditya Singh, the lawyer for uh, the University of Texas at Austin. In the case of Fisher versus UT, Ms. Abigail Fisher is a white Texas native whose father and sister both went to the University of Texas at Austin. Therefore, she also wanted to go. She applied in 2008 and was denied. Ms. Fisher claims that she was discriminated against because she was white. In actuality, what happened was 
Ms. Fisher's AI, or academic index, was far too low to be uh, accepting to the university. What the university does is, after the top 10% plan is utilized and all those applicants are accepted and uh, admitted, the remaining number of spots for the university are put into two pools. One pool is a pool where nothing goes into account except for AI and PAI. So AI is an academic index. It's GPA, SAT, ACT, all of the above. Then PAI is socioeconomic background, uh, extracurricular activity, all that after school stuff. So Ms. Fisher had a SAT score of 1180, which would automatically deny her any possibility of getting into the University of Texas. Ms. Fisher's uh, argument also does not hold up in court. Ms. Fisher argues that she wants to overturn Greller versus Bollinger, but she sues as one person, not as a class action lawsuit, which would only make one change to one university. That one change would be that University of Texas at Austin would be the only college that would not be allowed to uh, use race as a factor. Let me stop you for a second. You said 1180 on the SAT would keep her from being immediately accepted? Yes, sir. And so there's no student that attends the University of Texas at Austin that has a SAT score below an 1180? Not that I believe, Your Honor. Even on the football team? No. Okay. Now, Ms. Fisher also wants a uh, refund of her application fee, housing deposit, and uh, expenses for her uh, law, legal fees. Now that will not be able to stand uh, due to Los Angeles versus Lyons, which uh, says that, let me read you the exact quote, past injury may not uh, stand up in court, which basically means that if you claim as one person that you've been injured because of a system that cannot hold up in court. It's impossible. Does this conclude your yes, remarks? Your Honor. Justices, any questions? It's a quiet group today. So these measurements that you're discussing in terms of quantifying whether or not students should gain admittance or not, at what point does it become a sliding scale where their AI or their, was it PI? PAI. PAI would um, make them a better candidate. There's a minimum number, but then is it a point above that number where you're trying to build a class that is diverse? Well, what I said was there's two pools after the top 10%. Okay. The first pool, if you make it beyond the minimum requirements, we look at you individually. So if someone, let's just say there's two candidates and one spot left. Let's just say that one candidate has 500 service hours, the other has 200, but one candidate did this class, the other candidate did this class, so we would you know, filter out which candidate do we want. So once they meet that minimum qualification, then it gives you a lot more latitude to determine the makeup of the class? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, okay thank you for your time. And the attorney for Fisher, do you wish to rebut anything you've heard? You waive your rebuttal. Okay. Well, thank you, counselors. We will take this under advisement. The United States Supreme Court is now adjourned.
Welcome back, everyone, to Woodward Academy Court TV. We had a lot of interest on um, today's um, meet.com slash BKJ um, talking about the issue of race. All right, now, um, one question that we had, and I wanted to get you all's post uh, Supreme Court oral argument analysis is, um, is race a factor? Is it the primary factor? Is it the only factor? Um, and is this constitutional? What are you all's thoughts upon, upon the issue? Well, it's certainly not the primary factor or the only factor. The University of Texas, as uh, the, the lawyer for the University of Texas, I think adeptly explained is that this is just one of a number of factors, things like extracurricular activities, school leadership, uh, as well as, of course, the numerical test scores all go into determining which students get into the University of Texas. But mm -hmm. I, I think the lawyer there did a very good job of making the case that Abigail Fisher simply wasn't a candidate for the University of Texas regardless of her race, um, and that perhaps the University of Texas system uh, does include race as one of a number of categories, but that that's not what led to Ms. Fisher's denial. So, um, Counselor, what do you think led to Ms. Fisher's denial, um, and what is your take on her argument that it was she was denied solely because of her race? Well, I think the the issue at hand is that the Supreme Court probably took this case because they wanted uh, to relitigate the Grotter v. Bollinger decision, which established a standard uh, by which universities could utilize race in, in the admissions process, but not based on quota. Uh, and this case is just an example of a case that I think that they uh, took in order to relitigate that. Um, the attorney uh, for the plaintiff uh, cited the Bollinger precedent in which the Supreme Court acknowledged a compelling state interest uh, and a compelling interest at universities for promoting diversity, uh, which is the reason that uh, an exemption to the ban on affirmative action was sort of carefully crafted. Uh, in order to rule in favor of uh, the plaintiff in this case, the Supreme Court would have to decide that that standard is no longer uh, the law of the land and that it was uh, a mistake to provide that exemption uh, and I think that it is uh, it's sort of up in the air whether they're going to do that. All right. Um, counselors, I have a, a question for you. Um, a couple of questions for both of you. Tell the um, audience out there who do you think should win and who you think will win if different? It's an interesting case. Um, obviously, as a representative of the ACLU, we're pretty strongly in favor of the University of Texas, but it's, it's going to be a close decision. Um, and the Supreme Court really could go either way on this one. The interesting thing about the University of Texas's system is that the 10% program does create some level of diversity before race is considered. And I think that the court has an opportunity to flesh out exactly how much race needs to be taken into account, or at what point we've achieved enough diversity in order to stop taking into account, which wasn't an issue in the previous cases. Certainly the court uh, is unlikely to say at no level can race be a factor, but perhaps they will rule in favor of Ms. Fisher and determine that the 10% system is sufficient in the case of Texas, that race doesn't need to be a factor in those additional 20%. Okay, and Mr. Batterman, you are, you are a former lawyer for the government. Um, you have experience um, um, speaking before the Supreme Court. Uh, how would you handicap this case? I, I mean, I think that there are there are certainly a few votes that will for sure uh, vote in favor of Fisher, uh, and there are for, a few. For that example, will, uh, so the conservative justices will all vote in favor of uh, Fisher. I think the swing vote is probably Justice Kennedy, who uh, whose decision will probably uh, tip the scales either way, uh, and Kennedy is is probably. Uh, on the fence. He might decide that uh, the 10 percent rule uh, is sufficient to provide diversity and so uh, write a decision that narrowly overturns Texas's policy but maintains the Bollinger precedent uh, but simply rules that Texas doesn't meet that precedent. He might decide that uh, the interest in diversity is greater and that Texas's system meets the Bollinger precedent. I think he's unlikely to, to issue a decision that totally overturns affirmative action uh, and I think that he will be the, the, the swing vote. The swing vote. All right, well, thank you very much, counselors. We appreciate your stopping by uh, Woodward Academy Court TV. All right, now, um, studio audience and digital audience, um, guess what? I promised you a special guest today, and I will deliver on that special guest. 
Um, today, um, talking about uh, this particular case, we have in our audience today, we have um, the president of Woodward Academy, um, Dr. Gully. Dr. Gully, would you please, um, would you please approach? Thank you very much, sir, for um, agreeing to stop by our studio and um, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's chat for a little while. Um, before we get into talking about policy, um, um, let's talk about what you think about the students. How do you think that they um, did today in, their, in your presentations? Well, it's clear that they've done a great deal of research and uh, given careful consideration to the issues at play and I uh, think did very well in presenting their arguments. I want to commend you and others for the collaborative nature of this effort. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in education that much of it takes place in silos by discipline. And what you've attempted to do here is to combine a, a, a history class and a video class and our great debate coaches uh, in a collaboration on an important topic. And I'm delighted to see that we're truly engaged in interdisciplinary learning here. Oh, thank you very much. And trust me, it was a Herculean effort, but I had plenty of assistance by uh, the video department and plenty of assistance um, by our debate department. So thank you. Uh, now, Dr. Gully, as a special guest commentator, I would like to ask you uh, more specific questions. Um, Ms. Fisher's argument is that the UT discriminated against her because she is white. She argues that if she were black or Hispanic with the exact same SAT scores and grade point average, perhaps, that she would have gotten into uh, the University of Texas. Now, we understand that you are the former uh, president of LaGrange College. Were you ever placed in a similar position as the University of Texas provost is being placed in now? Um, defending your admission policies? Typically, uh, these kinds of issues about the criteria used for the admission of students and the competition for places in a class apply to institutions that are usually large and highly competitive for admission. Uh, so at a large state institution like the University of Texas at Austin or a leading Ivy League institution or schools like Emory and Vanderbilt and Duke, there are these kinds of criteria that need to be evaluated in terms of the admission of a student. At LaGrange College, it would not be classified as a highly selective institution. It was more of a selective institution. So race was not usually, uh, it, in fact, it was never a factor in uh, the admission of students. Though we were in, uh, concerned to develop a class that represented the real world, right. and so we went to great pains in our recruitment process to make sure that the pool of applicants was uh, diverse and inclusive. All right, thank you very much. Um, now, let's talk about Woodward Academy. Um, I've heard you and others at the Woodward Academy talk about Woodward Academy um, attempting to be a model of diversity education in Atlanta, in the Southeast, and even nationwide. Um, has Woodward Academy ever had to defend its admissions policy on the basis of race, as the University of Texas is doing in this matter? To my knowledge, we have not, at least not in the three and a half years that I have been at Woodward, has race been a concern in terms of our admission practices here. I think one only has to look at the makeup of our student population to understand that um, we uh, don't uh, apply race as a standard for admission here with 40 percent of our students as students of color. But of course, in our understanding, diversity is more than just racial, which is the primary issue at play here, right. and that's right. race. In our understanding, race is beyond just uh, one's racial identity and ethnic background, but might include their religious affiliation, uh, where they live in Atlanta, we have a broad geographic reach, as well as diversity in learning styles and abilities. Uh, so one of the things that I do think that make Wood makes Woodward uh, a truly national model is how we understand diversity in all of its scope and breadth, and that we have that indeed reflected in our student population here. Yes, very good. Um, now I want to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk to you a little bit about um, the potential impact that a ruling in the University of uh, Fisherburg University of Texas case will have. Um, even though this is a simulated Supreme Court experience with our, our student judges and our student lawyers, this is a real case. The case is currently before the real U.S. Supreme Court and they're going to make a decision probably sometime in the next couple of months. What impact, if any, do you think that a ruling on behalf of Fisher will have on higher education, 
secondary education, and on down? Well, of course, it depends upon how the uh, justices define the ruling, uh, but the pundits out there seem to suggest that if the court rules in favor of Fisher, that uh, it could be applicable to all public universities in the United States, and truthfully, by extension, to most private institutions, because any private institution that receives federal financial aid, which most do, will have this ruling apply to them as well. So my guess would be that if it rules in favor of Fisher, it could dramatically change the admission path practices and policies of institutions and immediately remove race as a plus factor as defined in uh, the Gutter case uh, for admission to an institution. How do you think a ruling with Fisher would impact Woodward Academy specifically? If uh, any. I don't really believe that it would. Woodward is a, a private institution uh, because we do not receive any federal financial aid dollars, um, we would not be bound by a ruling here. But even if we were bound by the ruling, uh, it uh, would not have a dramatic impact on our admission practices because we do such work in, uh, because of our reputation and the makeup of our student population, we already have the diversity present here. So it really would not have an impact on us. All right, now, as the exact same question but with respect to what impact, if any, do you think a ruling on behalf of the University of Texas would have on um, uh, post-secondary education, secondary education, et cetera? Well, if, it rules in, uh, if the court rules in favor of the University of Texas, then I think uh, the status quo is maintained. I don't think things change dramatically one way or the other, but I do think that uh, many universities and colleges, particularly those that are highly selective, where race is used as a factor in admission, um, would continue to use those practices. All right, uh, very good. Um, any, now this is the, any final thoughts on, uh, um, on your handicapping of this yeah. particular case? Considering uh, your you know, knowledge of the legal precedents and the, the particular judges and their makeup and their ideology, um, uh, would you care to try to handicap this case before the actual uh, decision comes down? Well, one fact check that I want to do for, for, with the attorney for uh, Texas uh, would be whether or not there were students who were admitted that had SAT scores below 1180, and I think there were. And I, I believe there were. To what, yes, uh, I believe there were. To that uh, lawyer said. That, if that's indeed the case, then I think it's, a, it's obviously a little more complicated. If you look at uh, how the justices have uh, ruled in past cases, I think probably the best that the uh, University of Texas can hope for is a split court, four to four, since Justice Kagan is not, has recused herself from this because of prior activity that she was involved with, uh, potentially with this case, before she became uh, onto the Supreme Court. Uh, so, um, but based on what I know about the Supreme Court and uh, its past history, uh, I would give the nod to Fisher on this You're one. going to give the nod to Fisher? Yeah. All right, but... <clears throat> that's um, not, not... I necessarily agree <laughs> with that stand. I just think that that's the likely outcome. All right, now, outcome. you realize, however, if the case comes the way you say as a 4-4 four four decision, then the lower prior court's ruling would stand. Yeah, that's why I say I think those who are in favor of the current practice, the best that they can hope for, I think, is, is a 4-4 four 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 decision, decision because then it would uphold the lower court rulings. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Gully. We appreciate you stopping by Water Academy Court TV, and you are free and welcome to come back anytime you like. Thank you. I enjoyed right. it very much. Thank you very much. Now, I, I, I hear that the, um, the simulated Supreme Court is about ready to render their ruling, and so we shall cut away from Court TV and go straight to the Supreme Court, and um, as they uh, process to give us their ruling, on this Fisher versus University of Texas case.
You may be seated. So after much deliberation, the court has decided six to three in favor of University of Texas Austin. Joining me in dissent were Justices Scalia and Justices and Justice Thomas. Court is adjourned. Bye. Bye.